We will now move to a second part of our program, and really it's, it's uh, my honor and pleasure. Uh, three fantastic individuals will join me here um, on the stage for further discussion. Uh, we have with us Dr. Manal Radwan, Senior Advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, His focus on Iran and on regional security. Ambassador Nancy Jamal, who is Chief of the Strategic Affairs Sector within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Bahrain. And Her Excellency Sheikha Jawahar Ibrahim Dueja Sabah, Assistant Foreign Minister for Human Rights at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the State of Kuwait. If you could please join me here. So we'll do it a little bit in a similar way as previously. I've asked each of our panelists to provide us some brief opening remarks and very excited to hear on their perspectives and in the areas that they're walking, uh, working on. And then I will again uh, open the floor for some questions uh, from the audience uh, and we'll try to engage sort of in a discussion for 30 to 40 minutes here on the stage. Um, maybe I can start with you, Your Excellency, uh, Sheikh Al-Jawahar. Uh, human rights is your field of specialty. You've dealt a lot with it at the ministry. Uh, maybe you can start providing us a little bit your perspectives on the issue uh, and the important things that you see in terms of the human rights dimension as well. I think it's an absolutely essential topic. Please. At the beginning, I would like to extend my gratitude to Dr. Abdelaziz Sagar, uh, the chairman of the research center, and his team for uh, convening this meeting. And uh, it's a pleasure being here um, discussing the human rights issues and Kuwait foreign policy with uh, such a, a great uh, audience. Uh, regarding the human rights, um, you mean human rights in Kuwait or human rights in general? In general and your work, how you have approached the issue and how you are dealing with it, I think that would be an interesting okay. aspect. Okay, to start with, of course, the uh, International uh, Committee all agrees on the uh, Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights and that's where we always start and the other uh, international agreement uh, and convention on human rights which each uh, of uh, the countries uh, signed and ratify uh, on. Regarding Kuwait, uh, as you know, we are uh, a party of seven out of nine uh, of these uh, conventions and inter international mm -hmm. conventions and agreement uh, on human rights. Human rights uh, uh, in Kuwait, as you know, uh, especially speaking on women, mm -hmm. if I, mm -hmm. if I may. Course, please. Oh, yeah. Women's rights in Kuwait nowadays, if you can uh, see and notice, we had a lot of uh, progress and uh, achievement. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can, uh, our uh, people who are following the news in Kuwait maybe can notice that uh, the Kuwaiti women in the labor uh, uh, market reaches 64%, and this is the largest uh, percent that we uh, reach since uh, we joined the uh, labor market. The uh, most significant uh, things that I would like to uh, highlight on is the number of diplomats, the Kuwaiti mm -hmm. diplomats in the uh, foreign ministry. Uh, we uh, this year reached 144 out of 517 diplomats, which is 22%. Two minister uh, assistant, I, myself, and my colleague Tahani al Nasser, she's the Minister Assistant for Legal uh, Affairs, and the two uh, ambassadors, ambassador in Washington, D.C., ambassador in uh, Canada. The other uh, uh, very important uh, achievement, the oil sector. And everyone here uh, mm. knows how uh, the oil is vital and important for not just Kuwait, but for all of us. And the uh, female uh, Kuwaiti engineer reaches 54% uh, of, uh, of the total engineer, plus uh, more than 14% of the uh, chairman of the subsidiary uh, oil company are chaired by women. The other uh, field that I always 
uh, highlight is the uh, women in the police sector. Mm. The number of uh, women police sector in Kuwait has been doubled. And uh, just last uh, week, we celebrated with them appointing 10 uh, leader women in the, uh, in the Ministry of uh, Interior. Uh, in addition to that, uh, women in the uh, uh, finance uh, sector, uh, we uh, women reached 26% uh, of that sector, and uh, in Forbes uh, list, we have eight women uh, influence or eight women leaders in, in that uh, field. And if I say that the first uh, bank in Jordan to be uh, mm -hmm. leaded by a Kuwaiti woman, which is Sheikh Dana Nasser. Uh, imagine in Jordan, not just in Kuwait, they have the first uh, female chairman in the uh, Kuwait Jordan Bank. Uh, in addition to that field also, we have the uh, woman in the jurisdiction. We have uh, the um, woman judge in Kuwait reaches 15, and the general prosecutor reaches 78, per, uh, 78 uh, mm -hmm. prosecutors. Um, nowadays, uh, everyone is focusing on the Olympic, which will be started very soon uh, in Paris. Yes. And I'm very honored to uh, share with you the number of the Kuwaiti uh, sport women. Uh, will be joining there. There are four in different sports out of 10 uh, Kuwaiti uh, participants. So these numbers uh, I uh, wanted to uh, highlight with you uh, today. Fantastic. No, thank you so much. I mean, this is really important to have this kind of information, especially also in your sectors of the society that you have not in the, tra in the past sort of dealt with, the oil sector, the police forces. Of course. Uh, uh, in Kuwait, we don't have a legal uh, barriers, by the way. Mm -hmm. No legal barriers uh, to want to join any of the uh, jobs that she wanted to uh, or she desired to join. Uh, the only maybe barriers we have are the social barriers. And little by little, it's the, so, uh, the society is changing. Wonderful. No. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned the, uh, the, the Olympics because, I mean, as part of the lineup this year of the Gulf Research Meeting, we also have a workshop on the issue of sports. Oh, so that so will also be something year, that we're dealing with. For the first time, the Olympic, as they announced, they reached the gender parity for everyone. So this is uh, first in history. Fantastic. No, thank you so much for the introductory remarks. Um, Ambassador Nancy, maybe I can turn to you. I know you have a huge number of portfolios that you are dealing with, uh, uh, counter-terrorism, extremism prevention, uh, counter-terrorist financing, anti-money laundering. Now, this, uh, His Excellency, the Secretary General of the GCC, spoke earlier about the extremist threats. Um, maybe I can just have your reflection a little bit um, on these issues, on the achievements and the gaps in terms of regional efforts to counter those threats? The microphone should be working. Yeah. Yes? Try Does it. it work? Can anybody hear yeah. me? Yes. yes. Yeah. You'd think someone who um, is responsible for so many offices <laughs> uh, and portfolios would know how to use a microphone, right? <laughs> but no, unfortunately, that's not the case, obviously. Um, for those of you that are here, um, you know, I could start off with thanking Dr. Abdelaziz and everybody that's organizing this place, but I need to also thank everybody that's here. I want to, you to know that I was one of um, the people that um, used to attend in 2010, uh, and I was much younger then, and I've <laughs> tried to come back over the years to ensure that I remain in touch with everybody um, that's interested in the region, in the politics of the region. And over the years, I've made so many friends that have supported my career and where I am today, and have supported the way that I think as well. And that's what I wish for you as well, to make friends and to ensure that you benefit um, out of this um, meeting, and I hope to see you in future years as well. Um, 
Now, how do I start? Um, it's very difficult to be sitting on a, you know, a, a podium or on the stage and speaking to reporters or speaking to people, you know, counterparts. But what is more difficult is talking to researchers and speaking to students uh, because they have all these um, other ideas that are, uh, I'm sure they're going to be um, holding me against later on. I uh, think, uh, just to keep track of time, I would like to get, uh, number one, I need to mention that um, the Gulf region uh, has always been um, at the forefront of the global uh, move uh, to counter-terrorism, which is really my field. Counter-terrorism, counter-extremism. Uh, if I go back to uh, 1991, where on the global stage, nobody was really thinking of, it was the time of the Cold War, nobody was really thinking of, um, uh, you know, um, counter-terrorism, and it happened right after the invasion uh, of Kuwait, um, where Bahrain uh, signed a defense cooperation agreement in October uh, 1991 with the United States. Uh, the purpose of this at the time was um, to pre-position uh, material and forces and give access to facilities, obviously, to protect the region. We move uh, along the years, and in 1995, uh, we see the uh, NAVCENT, the fifth fleet of the United States, was, was reactivated and was brought uh, to be headquartered in Bahrain. And this is, um, uh, the fifth fleet did not take part in uh, the um, uh, supporting uh, um, what was going on, Desert Shield, I think, in, in the, at the time, uh, in Kuwait. It was actually the, uh, the seventh fleet that was working at the time. But because of the growing need and the challenges on our sovereignty and, and within our area, um, there was a need to have more support from uh, strategic partners. Um, the, uh, in 1997, we had the Arab strategy for counterterrorism. Now you can imagine that at that point in time, really nobody was talking about terrorism. Yes, they were talking about criminal activity, they were talking about issues of defense, they were talking about the Cold War, but it was the Arabs really that were con considering the need for a strategy to work together to protect the region um, through a unified strategy in 1997 that was later relaunched in 2015 um, to uh, solve current challenges and to address the challenges that had emerged. In 2002, we saw the Gulf strategy for countering extremism that, re that resulted in terrorism. And this is really interesting because extremism was never really um, something that the world was really interested in. It was the Gulf region that was talking about the gaps in ideology across the world that would be creating a threat for our region and beyond. And it was the, the GCC that actually decided um, to uh, create this Gulf strategy for counterterrorism to work together. It resulted in 2004 with the Gulf strategy for counterterrorism because extremism obviously leads to terrorism and this is the concept that we work on in the region. Um, uh, beyond that, in uh, 2014, uh, we saw the Gulf Joint Security Agreement that was signed, that was later um, uh, responsible for the different working groups uh, that um, uh, go on till today. We have, in 2014, something very important happened to the entire world. And this is, I think, the point where everything changed, where the entire world sat up and said, oh my God, extremism extremism that leads to terrorism. And that is through what? The rise of Daesh. And the global um, coalition to defeat Daesh, and people don't know this, was actually established in uh, Saudi Arabia, in Jeddah in um, 2015. And one of the 12 countries that established it was Bahrain, uh, with the United States, with other Gulf members that were present and other uh, partners. Um, and then, of course, it grew to um, 80, uh, I think, I believe, 96 partners that it is today. Um, the, uh, the global coalition to defeat Daesh, uh, what has the Gulf done when it comes to countering the Daesh threat? It has, um, the Global Coalition has the main five lines of effort. Uh, 
And we have different countries in the Gulf that have been co-chairs to these working groups. Now, for instance, Kuwait uh, is a co-chair of the Foreign Terrorist Fighter Group. We have Saudi Arabia that is a co-chair of the Counter-Terrorist Financing Group. We have the Emirates that um, is a co-chair of the Stabilization Group and the Communications Working Group. And um, these different working groups have supported the work uh, that has worked to counter extremism over the years, starting from Daesh, but moving on today to counter other um, terrorist organizations that threaten the peace um, and stability of the different nations in the world. A working group, for those people who don't understand um, it's, uh, what it is, it's not like, um, say, the presidency of the EU. It's not about um, calling for meetings and coordinating meetings. Co-chairing a working group within a coalition is actually about directing the narrative, directing the work that is being done on the ground. So where we have reached today in terms of infrastructure, of psychological operations, of counter-violent extremism or counter-extremism was actually run by the co-chairs of the communications working group. The infrastructure that is today um, uh, working to counter terrorist financing was actually directed by Italy, Saudi Arabia, and the United States because they were the co-chairs of the CIFG. And it works uh, along the same lines with all the different working groups. Um, now, something else that, uh, that many things have happened since then. We have the Islamic Military Coalition for CT that worked, that started in 2015. Um, and we have different uh, things. But I also need to mention the... Um, uh, terrorist Financing Targeting Center, which um, I happen to be a member of the executive committee of this, uh, the TFTC, which is based in Riyadh. Um, its members are the United States and the six members of the GCC. Um, what this um, center does, and it's very unique in what it does really, is that, of course, it works on capacity building and knowledge share, on information sharing and intelligence sharing, on coordinating joint disruption action. Until today, in the past six years, we have managed to um, uh, sanction 82 targets uh, that would otherwise be financing terrorism in our region and beyond. Do I have time or shall I stop? If, you can, if you can wrap up. <laughs> yeah? so have okay, so um, I just want to say one thing about the regional security vision that I know His Excellency mentioned, and I know that Dr. Manal will be mentioning. Something very important for me specifically when I look at the regional security vision in our region, um, it wouldn't have come in about uh, unless these specific issues existed. Number one is the creation of available platforms, as in using the GCC platform and the Arab League platform to ensure that our vision actually spreads. Mm. Um, the commitment of our leaders to this, um, sharing re resources and committing to sharing resources amongst us, similar legal frameworks, common threats, and a shared vision. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much, Ambassador. I think it's extremely useful that you put it into us into such a framework and to make us better see where you know many of the initiatives are already coming from. Dr. Manal, it's just wonderful to have you with us here again. Um, looking forward also to the changes that are happening in the region. The regional uh, vision for security has already been mentioned. Uh, what do you see as sort of important developments that stand out and where is the region taking the lead on these things? Thank you very much. I, I need to really my heartfelt uh, thanks and appreciation to Dr. Abdelaziz for inviting me and for the leadership and the mentorship uh, that he offers and the incredible work that he does not just for Saudi Arabia, for the GCC and really for bringing peace and security to the world. Uh, really hats off to all that you do and of course to the GRC and, and yourself and Leila and others and all the organizers. Uh, I'm also honored to be speaking here after the Secretary General of the GCC, uh, my dear friend, Special Envoy of the EU, uh, Your Excellency, uh, Secretary General of the Commonwealth. Uh, your presentation was uh, really uh, deeply felt uh, with the focus on sustainable uh, environment and, uh, and dialogue and, uh, and the fact that 99.9% .9 of our genes are similar. It's, 
and how we need to focus on similarities rather than differences. Um, I want to maybe uh, beg your pardon, you asked me to do an autobiographical uh, 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 trip of uh, how, did, how did I get here. Uh, and uh, maybe I won't dwell so much because of the interest of time, but also because we are in this uh, academic setting, I wanted to uh, maybe reflect on my experience as a nerd uh, and a practitioner and also uh, as, be, as really having the honor of rep representing Saudi Arabia for the past two decades. I want to say that when I started uh, George Washington University in 1989 in the fall semester, the classes were uh, Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, Western Europe, uh, US foreign policy, uh, and maybe uh, a few others on comparative politics and principles of international relations. Um, and there is Gorbachev and Perestroika, which was a very popular class. Uh, it was very hard for you to get in. And uh, maybe a, a one minor class that wasn't even required uh, on the GCC with actually, uh, I'm sure you know him, Professor Edmund Gharib, who was teaching the same class at Georgetown University, George Washington University, and American University. Because, you know, uh, who would be taking a whole course on the GCC? Uh, look at where we are now. Uh, by the end of the semester, uh, November uh, of that year, we had the uh, uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, and they had to change the whole curriculum. Uh, we had, uh, in 1990, uh, 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 I think uh, one of the major incidents in, in, in world affairs, but also very uh, closely felt uh, in the region, which is, uh, of course, Iraq invasion of Kuwait. Uh, and for those who are old enough like me, who had lived before the invasion and after the invasion, know that this has left a mark until this day. Uh, this was a turning point, uh, and no one understood exactly what was going on, because all you can get uh, uh, in universities was maybe a political psychology class that would talk to you about why Saddam Hussein was so crazy, and you know there were no no analysis, nothing nothing deep to understand uh, what happened and how it impacts the world. However, that uh, moment was maybe until now one of the few and maybe the only uh, time where you had the region and the international world come to the rescue of uh, not only international peace and security but principles in international law. And this is why it was the most successful cooperation done, of course, under the auspices of, of the United Nations with the GCC taking the lead uh, and, of course, uh, successful in liberating Kuwait and restoring peace and security to the region. These are important uh, markers. Um, uh, fast forward, you had, uh, look, you had a new world order and in the classrooms the debate was uh, did we really uh, arrive at the end of history with Francis Fukuyama telling us that the new liberal order has succeeded and that's it? Or are we really looking at the clash of civilization with Samuel Huntington telling us that not, not, not too fast, uh, some uh, cultures are bound to be fighting against each other uh, and, and prone to, to conflict? Uh, the situation was a little bit better uh, in the Western world, so people of this new liberal, new realist didn't know what to do. So they said, okay, so we have actually a new liberal West and a new realist, uh, all the other. Uh, you know, these people are still not as advanced and they're still uh, are prone to fight each other. Mind you that genocide happened in Rwanda and in Bosnia, in the heart of Europe. And then we had the never again moment uh, recollecting what happened in the Holocaust, but also what happened with the C Cambodia, with the Khmer Rouge, and, and we're not going to do this again, and this is a new world order. It wasn't, uh, it was a very short-lived moment and never really materialized, and here comes 9-11, uh, and uh, everything that happened after 9-11, again, a marker between before and after. Uh, at this stage, I actually joined the Foreign Service and I was working, I started in 2000, uh, where things were rosy and beautiful, especially for Saudis in the United States. And then 9-11 uh, happened and it was the questioning of who we are, what we stand for, uh, are we with Osama bin Laden or not, do we uh, uh, condemn what happened in 9-11, and then the headlines of friends and foe. 
So you can imagine this is how I started my career. <laughs> And uh, I had the good fortune uh, of also working in congressional affairs uh, very quickly. Uh, we had the Iraq war and we had the warning from the GCC countries, this was a bad idea. Uh, you know, we are no friends of Saddam Hussein, obviously, but this is not a good way to do things and move forward. Uh, yet, uh, everybody that had countered uh, the uh, US uh, wish to uh, invade Iraq was uh, painted as a foe. And you couldn't, it was either, you were either with us or, uh, or against us, this, this polar uh, division, uh, uh, and you couldn't do it any other way. Of course, we, you know, I skipped over many incidents, Afghanistan and, and what have you, but all of these were important uh, uh, because this is where we are now. Uh, we are reliving uh, the ramifications of the post-war Iraq, we are reliving, or still living, on the, uh, my dear friend, uh, Ambassador Nancy, explained all the effort that we are doing on counterterrorism and countering violent extremism, but this questioning of, do you condemn Hamas? Do you condemn uh, any violent act that happens anywhere in the world as long as there is a, a banner of Arab Islam? You're always being questioned. Your identity is always being questioned. Um, and all of the securitization of diplomacy, and I mean, counterterrorism is great. It's, it's an absolutely uh, essential, and there's a lot of effort that is being done from the GCC in cooperation with others. But securitization of every aspect uh, there is, and also, again, using the human rights lens of value against interest. So these, you know, GCC countries or Arabs, we can't really talk to them uh, in, on the basis of value or human rights, but we can, you know, see how we can benefit from the economy and technology and, you know, oil and, and what have you. It's, it, it, every, in every turn, it misses the point. And in every turn, you feel yourself trying to explain. Even today, after 20 years of, of uh, uh, working in the foreign ministry on the different files, you still need to explain, are Arabs prone to conflict, violence, uh, gulfies, you know, uh, this, all these stereotypes about oil, environment. You know, we see it in, every, in, in sports events, we see it in COP. Uh, uh, UAE hosting COP, we see it in every other corner. And at best, you find people who would say, let's not talk to them about these difficult uh, conversations, but uh, let's see how we can benefit from the relationship between, uh, between the Gulf and Europe or the US or, or, or the rest of the world. Not knowing exactly how responsible these international actors are for what plagues the, 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 the region at large, including the challenges that the GCC were very able to actually address and, and move forward. So I had so much more to say, but I'm going to, to, to stop and say there are uh, a few points that are important and especially important uh, for people who are engaged in research, such, such as most of the audience here, but also policy practitioners. We need to get out of this defensive mode. We need to actually address the issue as it is. No one has better values than the other. Uh, we need to have difficult conversations in the region, but we also need to have very difficult conversations with our counterparts. We cannot be used and abused as it, it becomes fit. Someone decides to make us a pariah, they become a pariah themselves because of their policies and because of the way that they are dealing now with the genocide that is happening in Gaza uh, that is actually making all of us a pariah, uh, to tell you the truth. Uh, these difficult conversations can and should be also rooted in academic research. Uh, academic research that is not politicized. I don't uh, believe in neutrality. I believe we all come with a stance, but, uh, but, but detailed, analytical, uh, challenging theory. Uh, I don't think that, uh, I mean, I, I'm a practitioner of political science, but my specialty is in IR and conflict resolution. And to tell you the truth, I haven't seen a theory yet that is able to really make us understand what is happening. So uh, what my, my plea to you is to engage even at a theoretical level. Who said that we have to be put in boxes and we have to analyze our region by theorists who actually had very little understanding of where we are? 
And I'm not using this cross-cultural uh, 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 understanding as an excuse, as this is our culture and it is okay for us to do certain uh, aspects. That's, that's, not, that's not a way to go forward. That's absolutely not a way to go forward. We have to be critical of ourselves, but we have to use lenses in advance, uh, understanding that it would not only be benefiting the GCC or benefiting our part of the world, but also benefiting the whole world. We are at a point where the international system, yet again, just like when I was in the fall of 1989 in George Washington, uh, seeing really a structural changing, changes that are happening uh, at a deep level and uh, that are happening day by day right in front of us, uh, but maybe we are not really reali realizing the ramifications. And we are maybe using old lenses to understand what is happening around us. And here we will miss a great opportunity. I think agency is extremely important. I think the GCC countries, Saudi Arabia, has shown that they have taken responsibility every step of the way, and their responsibility included also giving good uh, uh, advice to uh, policymakers around the world, not necessarily that this advice was taken, and I think this has to change. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Thank you really for those wonderful comments. I have to tell you, my career path on Arab Gulf started 1989 at American University with Edmund Garib in State and Society of the Arab Gulf. So, I can't it, tell you that I was a student <laughs> in 1990. That would really age me, but. Uh. <laughs> um, in the interest of time, we are very short already. We're very late on this. I do want to give a really quick chance. Are there two, three questions from the audience? I see one, two, three hands up. I'll take those three. Uh, we could see some comments from the audience, uh, from our speakers. So the lady right here in the front, and then you can also. Hello, it's me again. My name is Munya Zeki, and I'm an AI regulator. Um, but actually, I wanted to ask you three women here, what is your advice for young women who are starting out in their careers and wanting to progress in perhaps not very female-friendly environment? For example, I'm born and raised here, I work in a British company, but my boss is Arab, and he told me not to bother coming to present tomorrow because I'm too ambitious and no one would want to listen to me anyway, but I came, I'm here, and you've heard me twice and it's not even dinner. Thank you very yes, much. Thank you so much. Yes, I had the gentleman right there who's next to your, uh, yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, I'm Saman Umar from Kurdistan region of Iraq. Uh, thank you for the goal of research meeting, for having us, and I gave attention to the Kurdistan region for this year. Actually, I have a three question. Uh, first, to the Ambassador Nancy Jamal. How do you evaluate the Kurdistan region of Iraq role in counterterrorism? And we have a certain example, ISIL 2014 to 2017, and do you need the Gulf state, they need the effort of the Kurdistan region? And to Sheikh Jawahar, how do you evaluate the Kurdistan region of Iraq to promote the human security? We have heard like the IDP refugee, when the attack happened in 2014, how they receive it? and uh, solve the problem, I mean, the, the entire problem or the internal problem in, in Iraq. And lately, I, I would like to ask uh, the Dr. Manal, do you think the, the Gulf will, will support the independence of the Kurdistan region in any near future? I will happy to have your answer as, not as the diplomat, but as a researcher. Thank you. Okay, now take the one more question that was here at the end of the aisle. Uh, yes, if I can have the microphone on this side, please. Can you just speak up now? Yes, well, better to have the microphone just so that everybody can hear. Uh, we can come around. Um, thank you for flying all the way here, much appreciated. I practice sports law, and uh, my topic was about BRICS and eSports. So, a question to you as practitioners, and you may answer if you would like or not. Uh, we did not mention BRICS yet, and it has expanded this year. So as you're practicing 
from the Foreign Affairs Department, and uh, Saudi Arabia is yet to is invited and in Bahrain and Kuwait. What are your initial thoughts or a gut feeling for the uh, BRICS expansion, and how do you perceive it? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Three quick questions. Uh, Sheikh Al Jawahar, maybe you have. Uh, to start with, um, we did not uh, have enough time to say whatever we uh, plan to do and we prepare to do. Uh, so regarding uh, the lady who uh, just commented on her uh, professor, right? Your boss. Sorry, uh, it wasn't a, a positive, uh, let's say, a positive message uh, encouraging a young lady uh, not to, uh, I don't know, you're studying, you said? Ah, okay, so, well, if I, if I was him, sorry, I wouldn't say uh, the same, I'm always optimistic. Uh, to answer your question, I have to go through my journey. I started my diplomatic journey with MOFA 2001, and I, I started as a political researcher, not as a political, uh, not as a, a diplomatic attaché. Why? Because in the law, we had a, a slight discrimination that time. The law has been changed and uh, amend, amended in 2015, but I got promoted to a diplomatic uh, attaché in 2005, even before uh, the law was amended uh, in MOFA. And uh, since I started my journey, or I started um, the diplomatic uh, journey with MOFA, I always had a goal. And whenever I hear that you will not reach, I always tell to myself one day, I will become an ambassador, and this is one of my goals. And today I'm speaking to you after 23 years. You think I did not face challenges? I faced a lot of challenges and obstacles, and I never stop. The journey was not just uh, in 2005 or 2015, no. I started two years in the international organization in Kuwait. And in the beginning they told us that we will not be nominated or uh, deployed in the uh, embassies. I got, in 2004, just two years after I joined MOFA, I got uh, nominated and uh, deployed in uh, our mission in Geneva. I stayed in Geneva six years, six years uh, 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 in different files, a humanitarian disarmament, a city which hosts a lot of uh, UN organizations and agencies. I was presenting my country in each and every uh, fora and uh, each on uh, every meeting, different kind of meeting, refugees, uh, migration with IOM, uh, ICRC as uh, the largest uh, humanitarian organization. It is based in Geneva. After that, I was uh, deployed in our uh, embassy in Madrid for two years, and then back to Kuwait in the Minister uh, of Foreign Affairs Bureau, five years, till I reached First Secretary. Uh, I was uh, also uh, nominated to uh, our mission in, uh, in New York, which I met my dearest sister, Manal. And the first advice she told me when I reached New York is not to stop. We are rare numbers of uh, diplomats from the GCC. And please, here in, in New York, we have to always show how strong we are, how professional we are. And till she left New York, we were too close supporting and helping each other. By the way, in Geneva, I was the first GCC till uh, a sister from um, Bahrain uh, joined and then from Emirates. So at the beginning, you will be finding uh, uh, so many challenges and obstacles. After coming back to Kuwait, uh, I got promoted as a counselor in the human rights department. And I didn't aim one day to be the director of this department. But alhamdulillah, we always say, thanks God, I got a huge promotion to be an ambassador, and the minister appointed me to be the assistant of human rights. Do you think 23 years 
was a pinkish uh, 23 years, don't, don't give up. This is my advice. One day, you never know. It will happen. And now I'm telling you, I'm so ambitious, and one day you will see me in a different position, inshallah. It will work. Just uh, they will turn it on as you speak because it gets louder then. Ah, okay. So you can hear me. Yes. <laughs> All right. Great. So basically, I used to work um, at an Islamic bank many years ago, right? And um, at the time, I was very junior, and I remember going to the chief of staff at the time, the COO, and I told him. I mean, I mean it was uh, an industry that was dominated, obviously, by men because Islamic banking was um, just starting. Uh, back in around 96, 97. Yes, I'm that old. I'm 47. Very proud of it, yeah? <laughs> um, at the time, I went um, to uh, the CEO at the time, and I said, I uh, want a promotion because I want to become something, you know, a senior uh, banker at the time. And you know what he said to me? He looked at me and he said, why would you want that? You're just a woman. And you know, at the time, that really broke my heart. But then I always go back to the fact that my father had four daughters, and he used to always tell us, you are the future. Look at Margaret Thatcher. And that is the role model that he put up for us. And then over time, it's been really difficult. You know, our generation had to go through so much to create a path for people in your generation that makes it much easier for you. And not to say that you don't have challenges, but the challenges we faced at the time, I wanted to get a license for a motorbike, and I was laughed at by the person that was attending. At the time, it wasn't possible for women to get a lot of what you are privy to today. But over the years, you know, you just push forward. Um, you have to overcome uh, many things. I, um, I think all this hard work in 2000, I think, and uh, 15, um, the then uh, foreign minister of the United Kingdom sent a request to my foreign minister at the time and requested me as the first Arab in history to be seconded to the FCO. Mm. You could to head the International Advisory Board. Me, not just a woman, but a first Arab. And that just opened up you know, my, my horizon to the possibilities of what is possible. Our region has changed over time. Today, our leadership support women. But to be honest, I don't want to be considered just part of a quota. When I sit on a chair, I want to know that I, mm. I'm worth this chair. I have the ability to create. And I came back to Bahrain in 2020. The new administration, His Excellency the Foreign Minister, Dr. Abdul Latif Zayani, who used to be the previous Secretary General of the GCC, he created the sector, the strategic uh, sector, uh, strategic affairs sector that I run. It has 75% of women, five offices, counter-terrorism and counter-extremism, counter-terrorist uh, uh, counter financing and anti-money laundering, strategic cooperation, uh, diplomatic security, and weapons of mass destruction. It is predominantly run by women. Mm. Women, I don't want to say, I don't want to say to women that you have to take, um, you know, the place of men because that's not what we're here to do. We're not here to replace each other. We are here to support, to be part of it. And you should never allow someone, woman or man, you should never allow someone to tell you that you cannot reach what you want to do. You put it in your mind and you attempt it. Today, I'm sitting here, I am a cancer survivor. Okay, I'm a woman, I've lost my father, my role model in life, right? I've been through so much, but I'm so proud and committed to what I have created. And today I have promised to ensure that we have a national and a regional caliber to take these seats, to take these seats and much higher. And we expect a lot of you, and we will be watching. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so, thank you so much. Dr. Manal, please. I don't want to change the, the, this to be changed into a, like an all-woman rooting <laughs> camp, but uh, uh, let me actually uh, answer the BRICS question, and thank you for that, because that was the conclusion of my uh, comments that I wasn't able to uh, 
uh, address because of the interest of time. So uh, BRICS or no BRICS, uh, I think the GCC have made it very clear, uh, including through the GCC uh, vision of regional security that uh, the Secretary General uh, gave an overview of, that we don't want to be part of a polarized world, and we don't want to have to choose between a Western camp, between China, the US, the Europe. We want it all, and we can have it all. And this is the agency that you are uh, seeing the GCC practicing. And I really invite you to read the regional security, uh, the vision of regional security, um, because I think at, uh, if, you, if you have a superficial or just a, a quick reading of it, you might not see anything that is uh, different or surprising. But if you have a deeper look and an analytical lens, you will see that what we are trying to, to uh, assert that this is regional, that the security and stability of our region is a responsibility of the region, but that there is ample space and an important space and essential for international partners to share with us where their interests and values are preserved and uh, serviced, but also where uh, who we are and what we stand for and our interest is also accommodated for. So we don't need these choices, and we refuse to be part of this polarized world. The jury is out. Some experts say that the Middle East could be a ground where there is an understanding between China and the US, and no need for, the competition, for, the, for this region to be the ground for competition. And that is good news. Others would disagree and would try to pull us in one or two directions. Uh, I, think the, I think that you will see that the GCC will always refuse. We will continue to have our strategic security partnership with the United States, and we are proud of. And I know that uh, my um, Ambassador Nancy had uh, mentioned a few of uh, the good cooperations that we have with the US. We continue to be an important trading partner with China, and we don't want to uh, but deepen that relationship, including in technology, IT, artificial intelligence, and what have you. And we have an important uh, uh, relationship, strategic relationship with Russia. We agree with some, we disagree with uh, other uh, policies, just like we do with all of our international partners. But it's an important strategic relationship based on energy. And I, will, I want to also add to say that this diversification uh, of uh, the way in which we have these, all, all these different partnerships is actually a recipe for peace and security uh, in the region and in the world. We have been asked many times on different files by, for example, the United States to please speak with China on this. Can you talk to them? And sometimes these files have nothing to do with the region. Or, please, you have a good relationship with Russia, including, for example, what happened in Ukraine. It's because of the strategic relationship we have with Russia that we could use our good offices to address issues relating to Ukraine and the release of the hostages and the children that were taken and what have you. So it is actually a source of strength for the GCC. As to my uh, Kurdish uh, friend here, it is not up to the GCC or Saudi Arabia to determine whether to have an independent Kurdistan or not. The right of self-determination is something for the Kurdish people to exercise. And as long as this is done uh, uh, in accordance with principles and in international law, this is not something that we can, we can have an opinion of. Lastly, on the woman issue, uh, I can tell you stories and stories, but I will, um, I will say that strive for excellence. It doesn't matter if you're a female or male. I, I talk to the whole audience, strive for excellence. You will always make it. If you give your all, you will always receive in return. Sometimes not uh, right away, sometimes things take time. But, but all of these obstacles and challenges only make you stronger, only make you more determined. So there will always be voices, and these voices are not, by the way, uh, exclusive of women. Some also young men uh, are faced with many challenges, and it could be about anything. It could be your ethnicity, your religion, where you come from, your class, your education. You're too good, you're, you have too many degrees, we cannot hire you. You have too little degrees, we cannot do this and that. I mean, there, are, there will be, always be excuses for people to stand uh, in the way of your success. Don't listen to them. Just strive for excellence. 
Just be your best every single day. You, the only competition you have is with yourself. Where were you yesterday and where will you be tomorrow? And it doesn't matter this gender thing. It's, it's, I, I actually refuse to be an all-female panel, but I did an exception for Dr. Abdul Aziz. I think it is over the board, you know? I, I, don't, want to be, I don't want to be invited because I am a woman. I, I want to be invited because I am an able diplomat, that, I'm, that I have experience that I can share across the board. So just, just be your best. That's it. Thank you so and have much. a sense of humor. It's, it's really unfortunate that I have to bring this to a close. What fantastic uh, contributions. Thank you so much for being on the panel. It's a real inspiration, and I can only commend you for all the wonderful work uh, that all of you are doing. Uh, in the